the final chapter we'll have for exam five and for the semester uh, chapter four is on heat and this is also related directly to lab extra credit lab all right as far as that um, later in the week I will do uh, a review for the fifth exam, which will start right after Thanksgiving break. So I hope you all be careful with that. Okay, heat. Heat is, heat is energy. And again, if you looked at the video on absolute zero, which had the extra credit quiz along with it, uh, the concept of what heat is and energy have always been kind of confusing. I mean, we've always, we had kinetic energy, one half mv squared. We had potential energy of mgh. Uh, so now we have energy from work. All right. And first person who looked at this was James Jewell All right. uh, back in the 19th century and what he was looking at is what ha what if we heat water if we raise the temperature of water what's going on and can we raise that temperature artificially so what he did was an experiment of having, and it's in the book, there's a nice picture of that, what he did of having a container of H water, H2O, and he had little paddle wheels. So it would rotate around as a pulley on top was attached to a weight of some sort, of some mass, right? And as this fall fell, this would lose potential energy, right? So if it fell a height, it would lose potential energy, MGH. And what he did was then as this, when this turned, he then measured the temperature with a the thermometer and tried to measure could this potential energy of fall be converted into heat and therefore raise the water. And so he then came, what he realized is that there's a equi mechanical equivalent of heat, right? So heat is equivalent to energy. And he came up with the unit of the cal, well, yeah, the calorie. And this actually goes back to the 18th century, 100 years earlier, uh, where Antoine Lavoisier, a famous French chemist, thought that there was that substances contained caloric, which was an actual substance that made things hot. And the more caloric it had, the warmer it was, the less caloric it had, the coolest. So they thought it was an actual element. Well, it turns out not to be the case. Heat, as we talked about, you know, temperature is, as we talked about earlier, um, Heat, the temperature, is directly proportional to the kinetic energy, as we saw back in chapter 13. So the higher the temperature only means the molecules are moving faster and faster. This would explain why they have a tendency to spread apart, because they're moving faster, they're causing heat to spread apart. It's not some substance. But this term calor caloric stayed, and we have the unit of calorie, and the conversion that Joule found is that one calorie 
is equal to 4.186 joules. So that was the case there, all right? So that's the conversion between potential energy and calories is one calorie is 4.186 joules. So uh, that's how that worked. All right, so that's a little bit on there. So for heat, both of these are both energy. Uh, they're equivalent, it just this is related to heat, energy more or less, and this is more related to mechanical energy. So I'll leave that up as far as that's concerned. We'll get more to this in a little bit. All right, we talk about calories and specific energy and such. All right. Oh, okay. So, so I talked about from chapter 13, temperature is proportional to kinetic energy. So what we're gonna do now is quantify this a little bit more using our gas properties. And again, from chapter 13, we have the ideal gas law. PV equals NRT, where this is in atmospheres, this is in liters, this is moles, this is R, which is 0 0.0821, and this is degrees Kelvin. So this is the unit we're using for um, chemistry, you know, more using chemistry. All right, now what we have is this concept of energy, temperature and energy, all right? We have what we call internal energy. And we'll get more into this in next semester when we talk about energy, energy cycles, Carnot engines, uh, thermodynamics and such. And so we define uh, internal energy and we use U and specifically it's defined as the number of molecules times the average kinetic energy, one has them be squared. Now, the problem with this is hard to count exactly how many molecules you got, and it's extremely difficult to figure out the average speed of, you know, to actually measure the speed of an individual molecule. So this is the definition of it, is the kinetic energy. So basically it's the kinetic energy, as we've just mentioned, but we can use it in terms of the terms we have, uh, is we define it as NRT. It, where R is the same gas constant, N is the number of moles, and T is the temperature in degrees Kelvin, and this will be units of joules. Yep. Okay. So we find that the internal energy is proportional to the temperature. And this is what led to the concept of, if you have temperature, internal energy, you lower the temperature, it's proportional, and at some point, three directions, um, X, Y, and Z, and each part, each direction, independent motion has one half degree of, one degree of freedom, so we end up with that. So this is how, again, we end up at the gas law so that when the temperature goes to zero, the pressure goes to zero, and the internal energy goes to zero. So, and again, this is in degrees Kelvin. So that's internal energy, as we'll be using a little bit more. And I should define that this is actually for what we call monatomic gas, all right? Right, so a monatomic meaning just like uh, individual atom, like helium. All right, so that's section fourteen two.
We're going to now move on to section 14.3, uh, which is part, again, directly related to the lab, extra credit lab on specific and latent teeth. So, So what we have is specific heat is given as Q energy heat MC delta T, where M is the mass. In most of the cases, we're going to be using Uh, grams C is in calories per gram degree Celsius degree Celsius and delta T is a change in temperature and since both Kelvin and Celsius have the same scale except shifted by 273 these can either be a degree Celsius or degrees Kelvin so when we're talking about change in temperature of, say, specifically water, we would generally use degree C because it's easier to do that. Now, specific heat, the reason I use these particular units uh, is that on the table, 15.14.1, there are different specific heats for varying substances. And whether you can see it here, and the simplest one is that water, H2O, has a specific heat of 1.00 calorie per gram degree Celsius. So it's, it's defined as that. What it means is it takes one calorie to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius temperature. So that's where we end up here. So if you have one gram of water, one times one, you end up with one calorie. Uh, other substances are higher or lower. Uh, generally, metals are smaller. Uh, water actually holds a great deal of heat for the amount of mass. Uh, if you have like say iron, Fe, iron or steel, uh, has a C of about 0.11. So there's, it can get very hot, but there's actually not that much heat held in iron. That's why if you take a very hot iron object, drop it in the water, the water just gets a little warmer. It doesn't evaporate or explode or anything like that. So that's, that's how that works. Uh, and again, water has generally the highest uh, specific heat as far as that. Some other ones that are even worse are lead uh, as a specific heat of 0.031 and other material is very small. So that's how that works. Um, and when we're talking about specific heat, we're gonna be generally dealing with just water. Ice has a specific heat, steam has a specific heat. So for most of the problems we're gonna be dealing with, we're gonna be dealing uh, with water, so T will range from 0 to 100 degrees Celsius. All right. So that's specific heat. And there are problems you can do related to that as far as that's concerned. Um, so let's do one example as far as specific heat of melting. Uh, not melting. All right. So let's do simple problem um, we'll get into these a little bit say I have 100 grams of water with a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius and 50 grams at 0 degrees Celsius alright now, we know if we mix the two together, we'll have 150 grams. So 
what, what would be the temperature. Now, intuitively, you would realize the temp this, this temperature will drop, this temperature will raise, and the mixture will be somewhere in between. It's not going to be below zero, and it's certainly not going to be above 20 degrees. So the way I generally do these problems, to make them a little simpler, is by do in terms of heat loss equals heat gain. This loses heat, this gains heat, and they end up somewhere in the middle. So what we're going to do is a heat loss, and this will be Q loss, and that will be the mass. So it'll be you know, MC times 20 minus T final. I'm not going to put those in yet. And this would be equal to M uh, hot, cold, C times T final minus zero. Geographical growth. So this is dropping in temperature. This is raising in temperature. That's why this ends up being positive. Both end up being positive. I put in the numbers 100 times 1 times 20 minus T final equals 50 times 1 times T final since the second term is 0. This becomes 2000 minus 100 T final equals 50 T final. Uh, add 100 to both sides. So we end up with 150 T final is 2,000. And then if we divide 150 by 2,000, or I should say the other way on, um, T final is 13.3 degrees Celsius, which makes sense, right? It's half, um, since we had more wa hot water and cold water, we would expect the answer to be somewhere greater than 10. If we each had, if we had 100 grams of each, then we'd have final at 10 degrees. Since this would come down 10, that would go up 10. But since we only have 50, the final when it's final amount here is 13.3 degrees. So that makes sense and that's our final answer. So it's heat loss equals heat gain. And so we're not doing anything, there's no phase change, we have water mixing water with water. So this is related directly to specific heat. All right, now the next thing is uh, related to latent heat, and we'll get into that next. We'll leave that up, leave the expressions here, as far as a simple case. All right, now. Latent heat. So we have our number specific heat. Q is MC delta T. Now we have latent heat. And I can't do this as well as the book does, so I'll just show an image of this. And what you have here is If we heat ice, if you heat ice water, the temperature will stay at zero degrees until all the ice melts. And then once it becomes all water, it will then start to rise until all the water starts to boil at 100 degrees. Once it starts to boil, an ice water steam mixture will stay at 100 degrees until all the water turns into steam. And at that point, the temperature will rise. So this is what we call latent heat. 
And the reason it's latent is kind of like hidden. Because you heat, you heat it, heat it, but the temperature is not going up above 100 degrees. This is a point of, if you're boiling something, it's not, if you boil, put more heat, it's not gonna cook it faster, it's just gonna evaporate the water faster. So, so what this is, is we have Q is M times L sub F for ice to water, or vice versa, and Q is M L sub B for water to steam. Okay, so that's the case there. So uh, now we had C specific heat. C is one cal, you know, one for H two O with the units calorie per gram degree Celsius. So it's nice and simple for for latent heat. It's actually notice there's no temperature. Latent heat diffusion is actually 80 calories per gram, and latent heat diffusion vaporization is 540 calories per gram. Again, for this chapter, we're only going to be using calories and grams for the most part. I mean, you could do uh, again one calorie gram is equal to one kilocalorie per kilogram. So that's fine there. And I should say also one kilocalorie, since we're on kilocalories, is equal to one food calorie, capital C-A-L. Um, and that's so that if you read a box and it says 80 calories, that's 80 kilocalories. So you wouldn't have like three or four zeros and everybody panicking as far as that's concerned. All right, so what does this mean? All right, that means that um, there is a tremendous amount of energy in steam and there's a tremendous amount of energy in ice or water and when you convert it back to melt. When the, there is steam, it, it's a great deal. This is 540 times that. That's why steam is so dangerous because if you come in contact with it, it will then condense to a liquid, contact your skin, and release that energy as it burn. Uh, also, what we'll find is that James Watt in the late 1800s, late 18th century, I should say, uh, realize there's a tremendous amount of energy that can be used from steam to drive steam engines. Um, this result of the first steam engine by Thomas Newcomen in 1707. And, but we'll get into that later when we talk. That'll be in chapter 15 next semester. All right, so that'll be there. So we have that, all right. So we have latent heat as far as that's concerned, okay? Now for this chapter, we're only going to be dealing with uh, uh, water, All right? The table 14.3 has specific heat, late heat for many different elements, also has it in joules per kilogram, but we're not going to be dealing with that now. Again, we'll be needing that next semester, but for this semester, we're only going to be using calories per gram for this chapter. All right, so let's let's do an example here, and then we'll finish up the rest of the chapter. All right, so let's do a simple one, and this was um, sort of what we did in lab, but I'll deal with it with ice as a simple example. We can do it with steam, but ice works. So say we have um, we're gonna write pen, I'll probably just use another pen now. Get rid of that one. This is blue. So 10 grams of ice at 
zero degrees Celsius. Right. And we'll mix that with hundred grams of H2O at uh, say 20 degrees Celsius. Okay. All right, what is the final temperature? Now, if this is water, back in water, we could, if this is just water, 10 grams is zero, 100 grams is 20, the 10 grams of salt is 10 times, so this would be approximately 18, 17, 18 degrees would be the final answer. But what we have to do here, heat gain equals heat loss, right? What we first have to do is melt the ice, so that would be the mass of the ice times the latent heat of fusion, plus then the mass of the ice times T final minus zero is equal to 100 gram, um, M water, so M1 times one, oh, times C times 20 minus T final. Okay. So what do we end up with? Uh, this will be 10, times 800 times 80 plus 10 times T final is equal to 100 times 20 minus 100 times T final. So add T final to both sides. So this would be 800 plus T final is 2,000 minus 100 T final. So we end up with 1,200, well, let's do it, 110 T final is 1,200, and T final is then approximately 11 degrees Celsius, all right? Okay, so that's what we end up with there. Okay, so we have an ice, so it's all water at about 11 degrees. So because we had to melt the ice first, the final temperature is less than it would be if we had just water and water. All right, so I'll leave that up for a minute as far as that's concerned, all right? So everything is perfectly reasonable because we would expect a final temperature somewhere between zero and 20 degrees. Anything out of that range and we've made a mistake or we have to interpret it differently. So now let me change this a little bit differently. Instead of 10 grams, I'm going to have 50 grams of ice. And instead, and I'll keep this the same, so the right side stays the same. But instead of the left side, I have 50. And so the bot, the, that will change. And this will be 50. Okay. All right. The right side stays the same because I end up with I start with the same amount of water. All right, so let's now multiply this. All right, make sure you're clear on this. So the only thing different is that 50 grams of ice. So it's 50, so the mass of ice is 50 in both cases. C is still one, it still starts at zero, and T final is still some answer. So this is 4,000 plus 50 T final equals 2,000 minus 100 T final. Okay, 
So then we're gonna subtract 4,000 from both sides. Um, add 100 to both, 100 to find on both sides. And we end up with 150 T final is minus 2,000, uh, which means that T final is uh, minus 14 degrees. All right, that's how we would, that's the answer. All right, question is, this doesn't make any sense. I can't have ice at zero and warm water and end up with a temperature less than what I started with. This makes no sense. All right, first thing would be to check is invariably something like this. Did you make a mistake? Um, look at our number. What's our calculation? Calculations are correct. The numbers I inserted are correct. Um, I solved it correctly. So what we have to do is interpret this differently. What we assume is that all the ice is going to melt. All right, you're assuming a final temperature of water. Just water, as we had in the previous event. We had 10 grams, that was it. But it's not the case now. So what we actually end up with is instead of that, we actually have um, an ice plus water mixture. And just to be intuitive, since it would take 4,000 calories just to melt it, and we only have 2,000, there's only 2,000 here, we're only gonna melt half the ice. So basically all we're gonna do is we'll have 25 grams of ice plus 100 grams of water, well, 125. At a temperature of zero degrees Celsius. All right, you can work that out yourself, but half the ice would melt because it would take 4,000 melt all of it. Using all the energy, just bringing it down to zero takes 2,000. And so that would melt half the ice that water becomes now 25 grams of water. So you have 125. So that's your answer there. So you gotta be careful. I mean, I'll have a question like this on the exam, um, but that's latent heat as far as that's concerned, all right? So that's questions on latent heat, specific heat, and that's something. All right, the last thing I wanna do is talk a little bit about um, heat transfer but only in general terms. Uh, we'll be dealing with more of this later as far as that's concerned. So I'll leave that up for one minute. And go from there. Okay. So for the last section, last part will come for this exam. is heat transfer. And this involves uh, moving, generally we go from hot to cold. Based on thermodynamics, you know, heat generally goes from hotter to colder. Uh, um, but you notice, you know, you know you know, if you have a window open in the winter, you seem to think the cold air seems to be coming in. That's true, because generally the pressure outside is higher than it is inside. But when you have colder air coming in, that's because hotter air is going out. So we have three kinds. We've got conduction, which is based on collisions molecules. In the 
This is the simplest kind, and this can involve a solid, where it ends up being the best, liquids, or gases. Okay. Uh, and this, there's no movement, it's just a vibration of molecules. So if I have a substance, make this hot, hot, cold, the, vi the molecules vibrate against each other and the heat transfers from the hotter to the colder. So that's heat transfer by conduction. And then we're only going to be dealing with this on a qualitative basis. All right. Now we turned out, as you might think, um, the greater delta T higher uh, heat transfer higher as you might expect All right so when the temperature outside is barely different than inside you don't get much change in that but if you have a warm inside as 40 below zero outside, you get a huge amount of heat transfer just by conduction. Um, like a window, uh, an example could be a window, all right? Because what you actually can get is window has a relatively small conductivity, so this guy gets hot, this is cold, so you have a, a greater heat transfer that's dependent on that, also on the area. The bigger the area, the bigger the heat transfer too. So, um, as far as that, again, we're only gonna be dealing with this on a qualitative basis as far as the factors that might make it different. Higher heat, higher temperature difference, higher area. So, air, area, A, higher, heat transfer higher and then certain materials and this is certain materials have a higher what we call conductivity than that so K is conductivity and we should call this thermal conductivity so the more the more the higher conductivity, like metals, transfer heat extremely efficiently. Uh, certain things, plastic, wood, transfer heat poorly. So a house made out of pure iron would be extremely cold. A house made out of wood gets better insulation, and then fiberglass insulation. And so air is the best. I would say has the lowest conductivity almost any scent material but that's as long as you keep the air still, all right? Because that will lead into the next thing of convection. And for convection, so that's conduction. Again, all we have is a movement, vibration of molecules, nothing is moving. Convection, which is actually the most efficient method of heat transfer is based on convection is uh, movement of molecules. So this involves the actual uh, movement of cold, warmer, to colder, colder replacing warmer. So this is the idea of like an open window. You get literally cold air comes in, warm air goes out. It's not vibrates, it's just the actual movement. Uh, this also has to do, you know, this is, has to do with a boiling pot. So you heat the bottom and you end up with convection cycles. The warm, the hot air, hot water in the bottom, because it's less dense than cold, will rise up. Cold air replace it, and you get convection cycles occurring. This is how we end up with our weather is basically due to convection cycles, as far as that is concerned. So this is the actual transfer of heat by the movement of molecules from hotter to colder. Or an example of this might be. Um, 
a wall, say a six inch wall, right? And, you know, if it's really cold, say it's minus 20 outside, stick with Celsius, and it's 20 degrees inside, which is about room temperature. Um, ideally, it would be if you had just wall of six inch, though, since air has such a poor conduction, it would be ideal to have that just a gap there. Now the problem is what you end up with are convection cycles started because what happened is the hot hotter air will go be on this side, cold air will be on that side, the colder air will sink because this by conduction this air on this side will become colder from contact with the wall. It'll sink and you end up with convection cycles circulating around. So eventually that cold air gets circulating around and it becomes poor. It ends up not being a very good case. So what you want to do is actually make that air still and you do that by putting in fiberglass. You put in fiberglass insulation. And what the fiberglass does is if it's packed very loosely is the air can't really move. So this basically makes still air. Now the con concept sometimes, well, if I got six inches, if I put in six inches of fiberglass, well, she if I buy 12 inch and pack it in, I get twice the insulation. No, you actually get worse because glass, fiberglass is actually a decent conductor itself. So we actually want the proper material for the wall. And that gives you the ideal insulation properties. Um, you also want to print, stop any actual air leaks uh, because again, convection is the biggest source of heat loss. Uh, a fireplace, you heat a fireplace, the air goes out, generally drawing the cold air. So a fireplace, if it's not used properly and with good vents and design well can actually be a heat loss rather than heat gain even though it can be pretty. So that's convection. Second part. All right, last part, this will be the end. And that is uh, radiation. And I'll stop here. So radiation, and we'll get into this later, but this is actually electromagnetic radiation, such as light, infrared, IR, UV, all sorts of things. So. This is how energy is transmitted by the sun. Okay. Air, space is a vacuum. And so we get radiation from the sun being a hot object. The temperature is around 6,000 degrees Kelvin. This energy by radiation gets transmitted out to here. And we feel that as, infra, as radiation. So visible radiation um, transfers heat here, gets absorbed, and then re-radiates as what we feel as heat radiation, it's infrared. Can't see it, but we feel the heat of that. All right, so we'll get into more of this later. So this actually works better in a vacuum. And once this process was discovered, it was the problem was is how does you know, if there's no medium here, how does energy from the sun get to the earth? So that was the question. Now what we'll see um, is this energy, we'll get into this later, but this will be more on black body radiation and such. But it turns out the radiation or the heat radiation is proportional 
to the temperature to the fourth power. Um, and we'll see that this temp the ra radiation of an object is very dependent on the temperature. Basically, this means if you double the temperature, say from 3,000 to 6,000 degrees, you will increase the radiation by a factor of 16. So if we have a temperature of, of 3,000 degrees Kelvin, and it's, you know, object radiates energy of say 1,000 watts, then if the temperature is 6,000 degrees, which is twice as much, the energy will be 16,000 or two to the fourth. So that's radiation. Uh, radiation works best in a vacuum. And again, qualitative that, but we'll be dealing with this on a quantitative basis next semester when we get into electromagnetic radiation, black body radiation, stuff like that. All right, so that is chapter 14. Uh, that is basically